Welcome into College Football Overtime. My name is Garrett Chapman. His name is Abe Gordon. We are on episode 25, Abe, and we are all the way through the beginning of bowl season. We are a couple of games down. We're going to get into some of those bowl recaps here on College Football Overtime. we got to talk about a little bit more that's coming up, down, coming down the track, I should say. With bowl season, we have tons of games to discuss between now and this coming weekend. On top of that, we have transfer portal news. We have new people who are jumping in. It seems like Every day, somebody new is jumping in and putting their name in there. Um, and the further we get through bowl season, the more teams and players that we see really affected. But I want to get into some of the biggest winners that we've seen. We've we've seen enough players commit and move teams that I think we can start putting together some, you know, some early reactions to what we've seen. But before we do any of that, I, I got to welcome in Abe Gordon, my co-host. Abe, how you doing, man? I'm doing good, Garrett, man. We had a full Saturday of football uh, the first seven bowl games, including a celebration bowl right here in the heart of Atlanta, Georgia. And oh, yeah. a couple games sprinkled in here and there uh, throughout the week before we load up for another full day next Saturday. So uh, you you hit it right on. Hey, man, we got football going on, but the off the field stuff is still just as interesting right now. Um, whether you like it or not, the transfer portal is, is an incredible storyline. It's an incredible yeah. talking point. And, and the other thing is, as we see some of these early teams that play bowl games early in the season, who may have stuck around for the bowl game, and then we'll enter the transfer portal from some of these smaller schools. Uh, we'll check the timeline on them, too. So, uh, it, man, it, 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 I know we're getting near the end, but it also feels like we're just getting going at the same time. Yeah, that transfer portal is going to be open up, up until the beginning of January or so. That's going to be this early window. They've, they've instituted a 30-day window. Uh, for this season, and I think it's been good. At least it's it's been a, a flurry of action because everybody's entering their name effectively all at once over here, uh, pretty much across the college football ranks. But <clears throat> so let's actually start there because the college the college football transfer portal. I have to say it's the biggest news of the week. Um, Malachi Nelson, he's the first big name that jumped in this week. Former five star player from the class of 2023 was committed to Lincoln Riley when he was still coaching in Oklahoma back in 2021. And then two days after Lincoln Riley, of course, changes over to USC, he follows his commitment. He, alongside of Zachariah Branch, they were the crown jewels of that first class, the first full class for Lincoln Riley to come in at USC. Are you starting to get a little worried about what's going on at USC? I wouldn't say I'm worried uh, because there's always going to be options. I mean, there's still guys that are in the portal uh, now that you could grab and, and potentially be started. This one did uh, raise my eyebrow a bit, and, and less in regards to um, Malachi Nelson. I just I kind of had penciled him in after a year of sitting behind Caleb Williams um, to, mm -hmm. to to try and be the favorite to go win that job and and, and be the starting quarterback for. SC as they enter into the Big Ten. So you wonder what happened, right? Like, did he ask for NIL money that the collective there in Los Angeles maybe couldn't come up with? Uh, did Lincoln Riley tell him it's going to be an open competition and he didn't want to <laughs> deal with that? Uh, did did Coach straight up tell him, or, or or maybe not tell him, but just doesn't feel like he's good enough to, to lead the program uh, and be the starter? I, I mean, who knows, but um, it felt like it was an obvious, here's your next guy. And, and I guess now not so much. So very interested to see where he goes. Kind of like Dante Moore of UCLA, a uh, little LA connection there. Uh, mm -hmm. Both guys going to have multiple years of eligibility, both guys uber talented. Um, and, and both guys ultimately looking for somewhere else to play. Now there's always the option that they do come back. Uh, let, let's not forget. You can enter the transfer portal and ultimately <clears throat> stay where you are. It's not the most common thing, but um, in this situation, I'm not necessarily ruling that out um, only because it, it, it makes sense in, in regards to, um, you know, this is, this is college football's version of a holdout. Right. Uh, and, and if that's how it plays out um, ultimately he could come back. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily predict it, but I'm not ruling it out either, but uh, Uber talented guy. There's only five, five stars from that class and pretty much none of them had done anything of any significance uh, yeah. thus far. So uh, something to keep an eye on for sure. Yeah, and, and one of the more worrying themes of this announcement is is players, and specifically quarterbacks, who transfer away from Lincoln Riley's system tend to not do very well. It's one of the most quarterback-friendly systems that exist in college football. 
I mean, just look at the the, the track record that he has of producing Heisman winning quarterbacks. He had what, three. Um, I mean, he was able to produ- to develop some guys, and and now they're playing at the high the highest level in the NFL. And um, the decision doesn't make a lot of sense to me. I, I think it came from just the fact that he was uh, he being Lincoln Riley was looking into guys like Will Howard or Cam Ward or Malik Murphy, and he saw the, the reports that he was interested. And maybe my, Malachi Nelson took that personally. Of course, I'm speaking just – I'm just thinking wildly here. Um, I, I don't. I haven't read that necessarily, but maybe he was offended by, by that fact. I really don't know. But this day and age of college football, you really have to be constantly recruiting your own players because he's a very talented young man. And as a result, you, when you have talented people like that, those guys are going to receive interest from the portal. And like you mentioned, it doesn't mean that he's not coming back. It doesn't mean that um, – it's really hard to draw any too, too many conclusions from this. Of course, this is, the news is still very fresh. Uh, we've seen a few instances where people put their name into the portal and then come back. It's not normally the way that people do things, uh, but it's not off the table. I just don't really know where Lincoln Riley – is going to go at quarterback now. I, it feels very much like it's not. It, Miller Moss is going to be the guy in the bowl game. He is the only scholarship quarterback that they have on the roster. But it, it feels increasingly likely that they're going to have to go to the portal and go find a new guy to to carry the load, unless he believes that Miller Moss is going to be that guy. But you have zero scholarship scholarship players in the class of 2024 and the class of 2025. You have zero zero commitments because you, of course you have Julian Lewis, the Carrollton player. A uh, five-star player who's people compared to, to Trevor Lawrence. He's an extremely talented quarterback. He's the only guy that you have in the pipeline right now. Outside of him, it's very bare. And that feels really weird to say about a Lincoln Riley team. I don't expect this to be the case for very long, uh, whether it's Malachi Nelson coming back to USC or one of these other top flight quarterbacks making their decision to go to USC. I don't think it's going to be a problem for very long. Uh, just based off of the track record that Lincoln Riley has at USC. But Abe, I do want to get into some of our biggest winners uh, that we've seen so far. It, we're two weeks in, I think two weeks marked on, on today, actually. I'm pretty sure today was the when it opened uh, just a little bit ago. So I do want to hit on our biggest winner. And I think the biggest one starts and ends with Ole Miss. I think Ole Miss has a golden opportunity. We talked to Roman Harper on Saturday, uh, SEC Network host, and he was on with College Football Game Time on Sports Radio 92.9 The Game in Atlanta. And one of the biggest things he said was, look, you have a a schedule that lines up. You have deeper pockets for name, image, and likeness. You have a coach that's interesting and dynamic enough that he's going to attract high-level players. And then you have the talent that's already there in place. And you play in a conference, and you avoid a lot of the big dogs. Uh, And the, the biggest dogs on your schedule, of course, Georgia and Oklahoma, they're coming to Oxford. So, it lines up very nicely, and the expansion to the 12-team playoff next year really opens the door. You add in the fact the name, image, and likeness money that they have that they could fit, they could funnel towards some of these younger players. Look, you have the number one and the number two edge defenders in this class. Florida's Princely um, – I cannot say his last name. Can you say his last name? You. Just go with you. I stick with you. Princely, Princely you. you. Yeah. Uh, I'll call it you. And uh, Tennessee's Tyler Barron. Those are the number one and the number two edge players in this class. Uh, they also hosted Walter Nolan, who's the number one overall player, who, who's going to be a difference maker. Uh, Walter Nolan, of course, the defensive lineman transferring from Texas A&M. Look, Texas, uh, Lane Kiffin's teams, they've been strong everywhere. As far as the offense is concerned, you're returning a lot of that talent, but then you're adding in a Juice Wells. Uh, I mean, look, the biggest weakness has consistently been pressure rate and allowing yards per play. You add in those two guys, that immediately helps. It alleviate, alleviates some of that pressure. Um, the, the issues that they've had in terms of pressure. You add in a Walter Nolan, that's a game changer. And I'm talking very seriously. They're not a dark horse candidate anymore. You add a Walter Nolan on top of everything else that you've already done. I'm looking at a potential national championship contender. Yeah, look, this is a team that's returning a quarterback that I believe and I think you believe that you can win with Jackson Dart. You, you got Quinchon Judkins is going to be back because – uh, he's a true sophomore. He doesn't have any other choices. I, I guess theoretically portal would have been a choice, but he I mean, said he's, he's he, hinted at he's coming back. Anyway. He's not going pro is, is what I meant. And, and Jackson dart, you start there. Uh, and then you add, like you mentioned, uh, a top sec receiver who was banged up a little bit this year out of South Carolina juice Wells. Uh, and then a bunch of dudes, just a bunch of dudes on defense, which is going to be 
uh, what Lane Kiffin needs to make the, make up that difference. Uh, they are hitting the portal to an extent where you do have to question um, and wonder uh, just just how how high they could potentially perform mm -hmm. uh, next season because I, I think you're right. And, and look, I, I don't want to play the schedule game and go through it, but th this is very clearly a push to bridge a gap, right? Um, they went heads up against Georgia. They went heads up against Alabama, uh, LSU. I, I mean, they've played some of the best teams in the country. They, they, uh, he, Lane Kiffin, mm -hmm. understands the difference between their, where they were and where they need to be. I think he saw it. I mean, he's seen it obviously up close when he was an assistant, but uh, I, I think further stressed that it's not going to just be on Jackson Dart's shoulders to get this done. And so he went and got some help for Dart. He went and got some help for the defensive side of the ball. They're making a push to compete. There, there's yeah. no question about it. And, and Garrett, this is where you get into the difference between a four-team playoff and a 12-team playoff, right? I don't know if they're good enough to win a national championship uh, when you add in these transfers. Maybe they are, maybe they're not. But are they good enough to play their way through a season to where they're one of 12 to give themselves a shot to then go get a championship? I, I think they are. And so now you start to see coaches who try and figure out where they are, what they need, um, and how to bridge those those gaps. And Lane Kiffin has, as you mentioned, he's not the only one whose uh, team and school has taken a, a big improvement uh, or supposed expected improvement from the portal. But I agree with you. He, he's one that really jumps out. And every, every couple hours, I see another guy. I know there's rumors of, uh, Mississippi State's top cornerback entering the portal and going uh, across state to Ole Miss as well. So, yeah, they're they're taking advantage. They're filling in gaps and they're trying to to bridge it uh, to get to where those teams are. If you ask me right now, based on what I know they have returning and what they've now added, if they're going to be one of those twelve at the end of next season, uh, I, I would probably lean more so than a lot of other SEC schools. I'd probably lean yes. Yeah, I, I feel like they've entered their name into the hat, you know, I mean, especially in this day and age of the SEC as well, because we talk about the expansion to a 12 team playoff. That's one of the big things that's happening coming up this season. But they're also doing away with divisions like mm -hmm. they they aren't trapped behind Alabama next season. All they have to do is be one of the top two teams potentially, and then they can go play for an SEC championship game. Uh, now, that's step one, of course, but that's one way of making it. The other way is just doing just enough and making it as a, as an at-large team, which very much feels like they might get some home playoff games. And it's weird to be talking about home playoff games. And it feels like we're talking about the NFL almost, but uh, no, this is college football. This is the new reality that we're going to have coming up here in 2024. And that part is very exciting. And I think it's exciting for programs like Ole Miss because they understand that they can gear up and go for it in a year like this where the schedule lines up, where you have enough experience that you can sprinkle talent to fill in the gaps, uh, you could really make a run. And I think that this is lining up very nicely for Lane Kiffin. This could be the best team that he's ever had in Oxford. And I think that lines up very nicely for him coming up ahead of this season. Another big winner I do want to talk about, year two for Deion Sanders. Deion Sanders, of course, the issues were quite apparent after you watch the team. You, you The team plays – for the first couple of games and they, and they look really good and they're kind of a, a flash of the pan of sorts. The biggest issue of course was glaring. It was the offensive line and protecting, protecting Shadur Sanders. He was hit more than any other quarterback in college football this past season. And they've added 15 new players in the transfer portal. And they have included like the biggest thing on that was the offensive line, seven new players on the offensive line. On top of that, Will Shepard, the top wide receiver in the transfer portal coming in from Vandy. He has 2,000 total yards at Vanderbilt the last couple of years. He's a very big addition for him. Yeah, they, this was sorely needed. I, I, look, Dion. Mm. first off, let me say this. Dion's no dummy. Um, and he looked at things. I think he knew going into the year last year what was going to be a real problem, and it was. Um, and I think he had all along been like, all right, we, we're going to get the portal. We're going to do this year one and try and get this base. Right. And they got the three wins as a base. Um, and, and now they are taking the obvious, uh, next step, which yeah. is to build up. Uh, there's still going to be questions on the other side of the ball. I, I, I kind of wish he had done 
a little bit more work on the defensive line as well. Uh, I do think they're going to get moved around quite a bit up front. Um, but, but yeah, they, they, this is um, self-serving in a couple of ways, right? It's obviously going to help out the team and the offense to give his quarterback a little bit more time. But uh, on a personal level, um, it is a huge step in allowing Shorter Sanders to develop properly as he takes – um, what, what is likely a year to continue development and raise up draft boards mm-hmm. um, and, and the ability to stand back there confidently and survey a field and make throws that we already know he can make because he's been outstanding when he has been protected. Um, just in terms of getting him to the NFL, getting him seen and to the next level, uh, this was a big step for that as well. Uh, it's a great job by Dion so far, but it does have to translate um, – you know, we, we swung the pendulum quite a bit in regards to Dion last year. We started here. He got a win. It swung way over here. Two wins, three wins. Then it did swing back. And so uh, he, he's got to slow down the swing into that pendulum and kind of sit somewhere in the middle, um, somewhere you would think or like to think around six or seven wins uh, in his second season would be a, a pretty impressive mark, um, especially as they do jump to – uh, a Big 12 schedule that will have some winnable games as compared to what they face this year in the Pac-12. Yeah, and I think they're going to have a much more manageable schedule. Actually, while you were saying that, I pulled it up. Um, look, you start up there with North Dakota State, which is no slouch. Let me tell you what uh, North Dakota State is, is, of course, notorious at the FCS level for winning national championships. They're a very, very tough opponent there. Uh, that's going to be taking place in Boulder, Colorado, though. Then you have a trip to Lincoln, Nebraska, um, Colorado State, Arizona, Utah, Baylor. I mean, look, th- there are more winnable games on this schedule than there were last year. You don't have that. Like, you missed Texas. You don't You don't have to play Texas. That's a big one. Uh, there's no Oklahoma because they're no longer in the Big 12. Uh, of course, we have our guest here, <laughs> sweet Chipper. We love Chipper. Um, and look, look, I mean, it's a manageable schedule comparatively to uh, what it was this year. And uh, I have higher expectations for Colorado. But one more I do want to get into before we move on. Fran Brown in Syracuse, huge, huge win over the weekend. Kyle McCord, the quarterback, comes in and he commits to the Orange. He, uh, of course, played at Ohio State for the last year. He uh, had a bit of a disappointing season, uh, I guess, by Ohio State standards. But as far as what you expect from a, a pretty good quarterback, this is about as good as it could get for Fran Brown. They're also in the mix for a bunch of other players that I think that they might hit on some of those mid-level guys. Uh, I know there, there are a couple of Georgia kids who were at least taking visits up there. And I talked to, we talked to Josh Pate about this on Saturday and oftentimes where there's smoke, there's fire. We'll see how much it actually translates and how many of those players they, that have visits and they're maybe doing them a solid turn into commitments and potential wins in his first year at Syracuse. Yeah, this is uh Boy, you want to jumpstart your program, which is what Syracuse has needed in the wake of what uh, they had kind of become the last couple of years with Dino Babers. And you're right. This is a great first step uh, to to settle the quarterback position. You could start there, uh, but also with a guy that's going to have multiple uh, years to to play under, uh, under you. Uh, and Fran Brown's done a great job. Look, we knew coming out of Georgia he was highly touted as a top recruiter. Um, and while it's easy to recruit to Georgia for a number of reasons that you really don't have at your disposal with Syracuse, Mm -hmm. uh, those skills are obviously transferring, uh, in his first couple of weeks there, he's done a great job. And I do expect, uh, look, Georgia had what 17 guys into the portal. I think at last glance, I do expect a a handful of them, um, to end up, uh, there at Q's. And, And so he's got, a couple of good first steps to building a program. Um, and it's just, you look at the opportunities that Kyle McCord was going to have out of the portal. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't think I saw uh, Syracuse being, being his ultimate landing spot. Um, but that is a very strong acquisition for Fran Brown. And and you got to expect big things, right? Uh, mm-hmm. I, I mean, you're building it up and you, you got to work on a class uh, and obviously you'll have a, full recruiting cycle next season but mm-hmm. um boy getting a quarterback in there that's going to help draw top receivers top tight ends uh running backs all, all that sort of stuff so this is a really big get for fran brown i i think you've pretty much nailed the three teams 
if you would ask me who I thought won the transfer portal in terms of incoming, um, I think you're right. Syrac- uh, excuse me, Ole Miss definitely would have been number one. And, and not even far behind them, I would have gone with Syracuse. And then you make a great point with Colorado as well. So uh, uh, coaches in different stages of uh, what they've been doing. Obviously, Dion's still building in year two. Fran Brown, just a couple weeks old there, year one. And then Lane Kiffin's been at uh, Ole Miss for a while now and using it differently to fill different needs, but all mm-hmm. three taking big steps forward uh, in the portal at this time. Yeah, and look, it, it doesn't take nearly as long to turn around a program uh, as it did in the past. I mean, nowadays you've got the almost endless potential. You don't have to build up through the prep ranks and, and have to convince younger players to come up, and then you have to watch them develop. There's there's more splash potential for head coaches now with the transfer portal, and um, I think we're going to see that with Fran Brown. There's always one player, one coach every year who we see take a massive step forward in his first season as a head coach. Maybe that could be Fran Brown over at Syracuse. I think he's been the early winner as we are two weeks into this period. But, Abe, I do want to jump into some bowl recaps real quick. Um, Of course, we had bowl season kickoff on Saturday. Georgia Southern, the first of those. Uh, Davis Brent throws three interceptions, two of them in the first half. He has four total turnovers in this game. Just a brutal performance from my Georgia Southern Eagles. They fall to Ohio 41-21. to Ohio has now won six bowl games in a row. So very impressive for the Bobcats. Any thoughts on that one? Yeah, they tried to make it a little bit respectable at the end, but but you were down so big at halftime that that was pretty much it. Um, yeah, look, you'll you'll notice this is a trend as we go through some of these other games. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of quarterbacks threw three interceptions or, or more, uh, or or had three turnovers. Some of them all in the first half. Uh, in 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 this case, and so uh, you could definitely see the quarterback play being a difference, and not that that's like not how it normally is in season, but you got so many guys opting out. You got so many guys that are forced into a role that maybe they didn't serve during the season. Uh, That's going to be a trend early in bowl season. uh, And that I do expect to continue as we get guys, like you mentioned uh, over there at SC uh, or, or the various schools. I know Jaden Daniels announced today, he's going to miss bowl games. So they they got a little bit more experience there with Nussmeyer, but you're going to see a lot of guys who are just making their first starts in these bowl games. And, um, some guys are sinking and some guys are soaring. Yeah. And Ohio was one of those teams that didn't have a lot of people who left and, or excuse me, Georgia Southern was one of the teams who didn't have a lot of people who left. Ohio was one of those players, or one of those places that did have a lot of people who left, uh, didn't seem to show up <laughs> on the scoreboard in this one. Uh, here in Atlanta, we had the celebration bowl, Florida A&M wins their first ever celebration bowl 30 to 26 over Howard. We expected a defensive game here, but. I don't think that's really what we got. Uh, overall, it was a pretty great performance, a great football game. The Celebration Bowl almost always seems to be a really great game. Yeah, it, it wild wild start. Uh, Howard finds themselves up uh, 14-0 five minutes in. Yeah. It actually looked like it was going to be a tie game uh, on a defensive touchdown, but it was. Yeah, I think it was a face mask may have been roughing the pass or whatever they called. Mm-hmm. Would have been a scoop and score for FAMU. Gets called back. Howard continues their drive and score. They're down 14 nothing. FAMU is uh, before kind of finding a little bit of footing and, and getting it going. And uh, w- once they got there, their defense did ramp it up, as you mentioned. Uh, they they didn't allow Howard. Uh, Howard had a safety, so you can count that for what you will. But Howard scored in the first quarter and in the fourth quarter, but they didn't score uh outside of safety in the middle quarter so the defense for fam you did ramp up the offense finally got them the lead uh towards the back half of the fourth quarter and the defense made uh, a couple more holds to to finish this one off this is a good win for fam you mm-hmm. um <clears throat> and, and a good close to their season 12 and one on the year for the rattlers yeah and and moving down to the new orleans bowl jacksonville state in their first ever bowl appearance yeah. they win it in overtime 34 to 31, Garrison Rippa hit a 27 yard field goal. His second career attempt, by the way. Uh, Jacksonville State ran 109 plays in this game. Just unbelievable. I, I don't think I've ever seen a number that high. It's the, it's the second most ever run in a bowl game going back to 1937. And honestly, the Gamecocks were, they had the biggest, they had the edge in this game. I always expect, I expected them to win this game. Um, but, they outgained them 526 to 247. They, they outgained the Raging Cajuns. Really exciting game. Really deserving for Jacksonville State. All they wanted was the opportunity, and they got it, and they took full advantage. 
Yeah, and, and, and uh, for those of you who may be slow to see this story, there's been a lot written up uh, since that game-winning kick. Uh, Ripa and kind of his mentality and kind of breathing exercises cool. and focus and, and all that. It's really a, a nice story uh, about believing in yourself and and uh, it, pretty cool for him to be open about uh, what was going through his head as he prepared for a huge game-winning kick, as you mentioned. It just wanted – a chance, right? Uh, both him individually to win the game, but also uh, for Jacksonville State to get into a bowl game. It, they needed some help, but uh, when they did get to the bowl game, they proved why they belonged. So uh, you're right, Garrett, man. It's a really good win for them uh, as they uh, wrap up their their first season in uh, FBS football at uh, nine and four. So mm -hmm. uh, pretty interesting story, though. If you have time, go find some of those comments. Uh, from Ripa, uh, the kicker, game winner, and uh, really cool. okay, just breathing exercises, mentality, positive thoughts, some some pretty uh, pretty positive stuff there. Yeah, and uh, let's head on over to the Cure Bowl, where Appalachian State moves oh, to boy. seven and one all time in bowl games. They get a win over the MAC champion Miami of Ohio. This was a great football game. It was a really ugly football game. Yeah, because Mother Nature really, really let her, her wrath be felt in this one. It, I think it rained. From start to finish. I don't think that the, the rain ever really fully let up. Um, but it was a slop fest. 13 to 9 was your final score. App State, of course, to come up with the big fumble at the end of the game to, to lock it down. Uh, honestly, great season for the Red Hawks. They finished the, the year 11 and 3. Uh, but the Mountaineers, man, they started 3 and 4 this year. The season looked like it was all coming off the rails. And, and then for reasons that we won't get into too deep on this podcast, James Madison, of course, not allowed to play in the Sun Belt Championship game. Guess what? That means that App State was able to make a run, and they ended up actually turning in a pretty good season. Uh, of course, it's capped off with a win in the Cure Bowl. Big game for them, big win for them. Yeah, it was a mess, Garrett. It was pretty mm. funny. Like, like if you just want to kind of enjoy it for what it has to be, there were five fumbles in this game along with an interception. Um, it, it, you, you could barely see it. Like, like the cameras were overloaded with rain falling. Uh, the logos were pretty much gone it, like seven <clears> minutes <throat> into the game because if you slid on the field at all, if you got tackled, you were just started to be covered in paint. I, I mean, it was a wild scene, uh, but that's football. And sometimes you got to find the beauty in the ugliness of what we saw out there. Uh, look, it wasn't the prettiest game. Uh, no one could hold on to the ball, but it was still enjoyable. It was still competitive. It was compelling as well. They had to hold the entire fourth quarter, as you mentioned, getting a late fumble yep. uh, there for App State. So, yeah, not not scenically not the uh, <laughs> best game I've ever seen, but uh, it was kind of a fun one to just sit back and watch people mess around in the rain a little bit. That's bowl season, baby. And it's, yeah. uh, it's just always so much fun whenever weird things happen in these kinds of games. But the New Mexico Bowl, New Mexico bowl was effectively a home game for New Mexico State, but that's not enough for them. Fresno State takes him down, even though Jeff Tedford is not on the sideline. Of course, he steps aside for, for health reasons ahead of bowl prep. Uh, then the quarterback, Mikey Keene, he steps up in a big way, 31 of 39, 380 yards and three touchdowns, including a fourth score on the ground. Seven different Fresno State receivers caught at least three passes each. Just a, a, an overwhelmingly dominant effort from Fresno State on offense. They finished the game with 37 points, and they hold New Mexico State, a, who had a really good season, including highlight wins over Auburn. Mm -hmm. uh, this season, they, they they appear in their, the, I think it was the Mountain West Championship earlier this season. Look, great season for them over there at New Mexico State, but it comes to a crashing halt with Fresno State with getting the win in the New Mexico Bowl. Yeah, another story to follow here there, is the, uh, the, the comments from uh, New Mexico State head coach Jerry Kill mm -hmm. after the game. Obviously, this game was played at New Mexico. Um, and, and the rivalry between New Mexico State and New Mexico, and there were some situations that went awesome. down earlier in the year that now kind of came back to bite New Mexico State because New Mexico didn't want them using their indoor practice facility uh, because of some humanity and control issues later uh, from earlier in the season. It, it was a mess. Uh, Jerry killed. He doesn't give any Fs at this point in his career. He pretty much said that. He's like, you can fire me. I'll be on a beach drinking margaritas, enjoying the rest of my life. <laughs> and so he went ham on New Mexico. Like, that was hilarious. Um, and, yeah, you just talk about, like, this, only in bowl season does this stuff happen. Uh, boy, does it. Uh, look, it, it was a good win, as you mentioned, for, for Fresno State. And, and that was actually one of my concerns heading into the game is how do they, you know, 
late, late stages of this game if it's competitive without Jeff Tedford, who was missing the game. But that wasn't a concern. They took care of business early uh, and cruised throughout this, and then uh, that led Jerry Kill. And, look, part of that's the frustration of you guys not showing up in a game, and part of that's uh, the way you felt you were treated by a rival. But, uh, boy, it's, it's find the comments. They're, they're pretty fun. It was it was pretty great. I I, I thought very long and hard about actually playing those comments here on the show, but uh, didn't have a chance to go find the video. So so uh, unfortunately, no one is. You got to look, look that one up on your own. But let's on it out to the L.A. Bowl. UCLA dominates Boise State in this one. This has been a very interesting season for Chip Kelly. Um, of course, you have the win over USC, which is a huge win for him. Probably saved his job. And then you turn around and lose thirty three to seven to Cal. Uh, a lot of people thought that he was going to get fired, but of course UCLA, they bounce back in this one. They get the win over Boise State. And look, Chip Kelly, they've already announced that he's going to keep his job. The offense showed up in a big way, 510 yards of total offense. And they ran the ball for 280, which is a, a really, really good performance, which, which is very, you know, typical from what you would see from a Chip Kelly offense, or at least looking in the past. But it was the offense that really, or the defense rather, that showed up in a big way. Uh, they hold a really good Boise State offense to 22 points. Yeah, speaking about Jerry Kill's comments, uh, obviously Chip Kelly had had some great comments in regards to yeah. the the state of college football moving forward. So I certainly urge people to find what he said. I think it's about two minutes with some outstanding thoughts uh, from him on, on where the sport is headed. Look, this was an interesting game. Uh, it, it set up for Ethan Garbers, uh, who who was the bat. You remember, Dante Moore is 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 into the portal, so he's not playing. So Colin Schley was your starting quarterback for UCLA. He gets hurt uh, midway through the third, early stages of the third quarter. And Ethan Garbers comes in and throws two touchdowns, goes 9-12. to Essentially, it's a flu game. Like, like he told Coach uh, Chip Kelly, he didn't know if he's going to be able to play physically. He didn't really feel up to it. Uh, but when push came to shove and, and Schley goes down with injury, uh, he steps in and, and has an outstanding uh, second half, 152 yards, two touchdowns. Uh, I think he ended up being named offensive MVP for that game. Mm -hmm. um, so coming off the bench, only playing the second half, uh, pretty impressive showing for him. But but uh, yeah, the story. Unfortunately, uh, you know, sometimes the story gets taken away from the game itself. You did a good job, Garrett, discussing the game, but uh, the comments from Chip Kelly afterwards uh, very thought provoking. Uh, look, nothing new, right? Not revolutionary. Calls for a commissioner of the sport. A mm -hmm. lot of people would agree with that, but uh, did have some some well thought out and, and well um, diagrammed comments in regards to that. So, a uh, kudos to Chip Kelly. And I do want to discuss those comments, maybe not on this podcast right now. Uh, yeah. Maybe we can do that coming up here on, on the third day, Thursday edition, because I think that was a very interesting comment from Chip, Chip sure. Kelly. Um, and I think it's worth diving into. So uh, make yeah. sure you're tuning in on Thursday. We're going to discuss that coming up here on the College Football Overtime podcast. But, hey, the last one that we have to react to was the nightcap of the of, of Saturday's game uh, games, I should say. California and Texas Tech, the Red Raiders take down the Golden Bears 34 to 14. Right on the heels of Jaden Ott, who really had a great season for the Golden Bears. Uh, he totaled 1,200 yards, 11 touchdowns this season, didn't really get anything going in this one. He just announced that he's going to be coming back to Cal for his next season. Only gets 45 yards in this one on 16 carries. Does get the touchdown, though, um, but it's only one of two, and they fall short against the Red Raiders, who really played at a high level. Uh, Baron Morton, uh, the sophomore, tossed three first-half touchdowns to get the win for the Red Raiders. Yeah, and on the flip <laughs> side, three interceptions for Cal quarterback Fernando Mendoza. And, sure. and again, we saw that in quite a number of these games. We talked about Georgia Southern. We talked about the fumbling issues for Miami and that loss to to App State. And now in this one, three interceptions. So, uh, look, it, it, it's you, you've talked about it. Unfortunately, these games are as much about the practices leading up as they are about the performances. Yeah. Uh, and for Cal, unfortunately, that's kind of how it looked. It looked like they were just going through the motions uh, a, a little bit. But, um, you know, they, it, it was close towards halftime. Uh, and then it kind of just got away from them in the second half. And, and uh, that's how you see uh, a comfortable Red Raider victory. But, um, look, it, it was a great day overall on Saturday. You got you started early, right, with the 11 a.m., and then mm -hmm. it goes deep into the night. So it, it was a fun game. Seven of them things uh, on Saturday. And let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven more 
uh, coming this Saturday. We've also got a game on Thursday uh, and Friday, and then you know, so we're, we are we are loaded up with bowl games. I'm I'm ready for it. There's there's one on my TV right now. So we're recording this in the afternoon. We got a a little pre Monday night football lead in. So hey, uh, pre- pretty pumped to be watching again. Now it's a blowout. So <clears throat> kind of started watching Titanic at some point here because. Uh, every time Titanic's on, I got to break down the poker scene like I'm Norman Chad or something. <laughs> but it's a ter- They don't know what they're doing in poker. They don't know what they're doing. It's pretty terrible. Uh, anyway, it's pretty brutal. Uh, yeah, a lot of bowl games throughout the week, uh, including on Saturday. You're going to be at one in, in a yes, couple of days. We'll, we're going to talk about that on Wednesday, excuse me, on Thursday uh, mm. as well. Look forward to that discussion. But um, just getting started, man. Seven down, uh, eight down as the one is going to wrap up soon. And then uh, we got a bunch more. So, uh, let, let's buckle up for it. Yep, we got a lot of bowl games that we got to discuss. Real quick, before we do that, I do want to talk about the one bowl game that we have between now and Thursday's show, if you want to do that real quick. Um, and then we'll save the rest of these, of course, for our Thursday podcast. Uh, it's the Frisco Bowl. Real quick. Folk, or Excuse me. The uh, So it's UTSA and Marshall. Both of these teams coming into this one with a little bit of momentum. Uh, the Roadrunners, a resounding 13-point favorite. They were a win away. UTSA was from playing in the AAC championship after the yeah. slow start to this. Season. And, and then Marshall, they started the season with a four game winning streak, lost five straight, finished with two wins with 35 points each to reach bowl eligibility in a tough Sunbelt conference. This should be an interesting game for a little bit. I just think the road runners are going to, you know, run away with this one. Yeah. I, I think there's too much offensively for, for the road runners. Uh, Frank Harris, the quarterback has been outstanding uh this season um and and really for the most of his career uh you know senior quarterback uh we'll see what the next stage for him is but Mm -hmm. i think there's too much on offense uh i I just kind of wish this one because i'm getting old garrett i'll be honest i'm getting old this is a nine o'clock kick and i wish it was like a 7 30 game for me why is it so Uh, late on i I, uh, you know it's in it's in texas so so it's eight o'clock local you try and figure out. I haven't looked at the TV to see if it's leading into something or if it's coming off of something. But um, you know, some odd. That, that is the one thing I will mention. I understand Monday Night Football for uh, you, you know this game that Old Dominion was up twenty eight nothing in the 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 toastery bowl. Um, you know, that's a two thirty kick on a Monday. You're leading into Monday Night Football. I get it. I'd almost rather it be opposite Monday Night Football on yeah. like ESPN two or something, but. It is what it is, but yeah, nine o'clock on a on a Tuesday night. I'm uh, I'm just gonna be honest with you. I'm I'm probably not gonna make it to the second half. We'll see. We'll see what yeah. happens. I don't. We'll we'll see if Marshall even makes it to the second half. Yeah, there you go. Thirteen point favorites in a bowl game is pretty resounding. Um, and generally, what happens when you see spreads like that is blowout city. Um, now when you and, get to Kirby Smart, they don't believe that you can do it. Speech is that is maybe that they do. For bowl games? I don't know. The right. thundering herd. Uh, they. They're an interesting bunch. They've had a, a a very hot and cold type of season. So you never know. Maybe they show up in a big way for this one, but I just don't see that one happening. But, hey, that's it for us today on the College Football Overtime Podcast. On Thursday, you can look forward to our discussion regarding Chip Kelly's comments that he made yeah. after his bowl game uh, over the weekend. Also got to talk about the Boca Raton Bowl. We've got the Gasparilla Bowl. We have seven games to be played on Saturday, including the Birmingham Bowl, the Camellia Bowl, the Lockheed Martin, James Madison's first ever bowl game. So many exciting matchups that we got to get into right here on the College Football Overtime Podcast. So make sure you are subscribed. Make sure you like this video. Make sure you drop a comment. Tell us what you what you like, what you want us to talk about next time. Maybe we'll do that. But for Gordon, my name is Garrett Chapman. We are College Football Overtime. We will see you right here on Thursday.